Hi everyone, I'm Michael Short. This is Let's Go Outdoors. Let's go outdoors where the waters run clear and cold. Mother Nature's world is better than gold. So much to see, so much to do. Let's go outdoors, me and you. Let's Go Outdoors with Michael Short. Supported by the Alberta Conservation Association. Hi everyone, welcome to Let's Go Outdoors. I'm Michael Short. Welcome back to our second season. Coming up on this week's program. Okay, hike babies, hike. We'll go mushing with Elma, Apache, and the rest of her dog sled team as they take us for a winter ride in the beautiful Kananaskis country. We'll dive into the chilly waters of Cold Lake to see what researchers are doing to improve their chances of catching a very rare fish in our province. And Mary hits the books and enrolls in Alberta's hunter education program. Welcome to the Conservation Hunter Education Program. Hey everyone, excited to share with you stories from across this great province of ours and to help spin the tale of these adventures, it's great to have Elma back for another season. It's great to be back, Michael. And joining our merry band of marauders, Mary Hulbert. I'm very excited to be here. Hey Elma, so last season you started off by taking us on a winter camping adventure. This year though, you kind of gone to the dogs. Yes, dog sledding, and I'm a pretty darn good musher. You know, we had an amazing experience there. And wow, the Rocky Mountains in wintertime are just stunning. So did you make some new furry friends? Let's find out. <laughs> when it comes to showing the love, nobody does it better than Carlin. Oh, we're gonna have a nice time today. She's going to be my instructor and guide today. With Snowy Owl Tours, everyone starts with a half hour orientation. Now as a parking brake, a nice hard pack section of snow, give that a kick. Now that is only an assist. We do not trust it 100%. <laughs> the dogs seem to know that soon it will be time to go out. We're going to let the other teams head out first. <laughs> to my surprise, the proper command to start going is not mush, it's hike. Okay, hike babies, hike. Yeah! With Snowy Owl Tours, you do have the option of letting an instructor drive or the freedom to drive your very own dog sled team. Time to meet my team. Alma, your lead dog, Apache, and he's Siberian Husky. And he's going to be your solo lead up here, eh, buddy? Apache's going to run the show. Yeah, you're going to run the show. Hi, boy. The very gorgeous Shira, Princess of Power, that's her full full name, but we just call her Shira. Hi, Shira. And she is called a Canadian Indian Husky. So this is our breed closest relative to the coyote. And then of course, the two brutes, your big boys, the wheel dogs, the power. Come here, boys, Squeaky, come on. Because they are bigger, they generally are slower. So that's why they have to run back here. Otherwise, if they were up front, they would slow the whole team down, wouldn't you boys? And then uh, of course, the driving back here. The funnest part. <laughs> yes, the funnest part. So most importantly, your number one most important rule. Never let go. Never let go. So you always have your hands on the handlebar at all times, very important. Second most important, stopping the sled. Two feet on the brake, all of your weight, as hard as you can. Yeah, you got her. That's it. And also remember positive encouragement and reinforcement because these dogs thrive off of love. So good dogs, good puppies. Really make sure that they know they're doing well because they'll pull their little butts off for you. So they're no different than men. All right, away we go. Carlin leads the way. It's a brisk winter day, but it's beautiful out here. We're a half hour drive south of Banff and Canmore in the heart of Alberta's Kananaskis country. The Rocky Mountains look stunning. A whiskey jack watches us go by. It's a postcard day. Good, happy. Good, happy. These dogs are born to run. Don't you think it even looks like they're smiling as they go? One thing I didn't realize, as a musher, you need to get off the rails and run up the hill. It certainly helps keep me warm. I am having a blast. Got amazing dogs guiding me, beautiful scenery. The wind, probably not very safe to let go because you're never supposed to let go. Hi. Carlin is a musher from birth. 
Her parents started the business before she was born, so she's been a musher since she was knee-high to a Siberian husky. For her, the greatest joy is seeing how much fun others like me have doing it for the first time. yee And sometimes people have tears in their eyes, they give you a hug, they're so excited. And that, that truly is why we, we love to do this. Good puppy! The reason we use six different breeds Good is not job. just because they're the best at what they do, but it's also so people can see breeds that would normally be in places like Baffin Islands, Akalawit, Nunavut, or even Russia. You know, the Sepala Siberian Husky comes from Russia. And the Inuit Husky, the Hudson, the big fluffy one that we saw today, you know, he's originally from Yellowknife. Carlin says the Canadian Inuit Husky is almost extinct with just 400 registered in the world. And that's why it's so important to preserve these bloodlines. Good puppies! Before you know it, our 10K ride has come to an end. Wow, oh, what an experience. Oh. Excellent power slide. Now it's time to give our hardworking crew some doggy Gatorade. It's a mix of protein and fat. Because the dog's been eating snow, that actually dehydrates them. So like humans, we need to drink and consume room temperature warm to keep ourselves hydrated. So in these thermoses, we bring boiled water, and by the time it touches the cold bowls, it's a good temperature to drink. These dogs burn 2,000 or more calories in a day. They're fed after each run. And you want to slide them in nice and close so that there's no argument over whose is whose. As an extra reward, the dogs get a nutritious, tasty treat. Carlin tells me to be careful, or my fingers could be part of the snack. It turns out many of my fellow mushers have come from faraway places. Good dog! We, we thoroughly enjoyed it. It was great fun. Even falling off was good. <laughs> you fell? Yeah. Please tell us about it. I can't. I just fell off. <laughs> one minute I was on the sled and the next minute on the ground. It was awesome, the whole the whole trip. Like I've done the two hour trip before and the four hour trip was just amazing. Did you take a fall at any point? Uh, no, we ran through a tree, <laughs> only a small one, but it was great. No falls, no, it was good. If you guys want to check out these amazing tours, just visit snowyowltours.com. Hi, Avalanche. Hi. Alma, it looks like you really put those dogs through their paces. Are you kidding me? Those guys loved it. Did you see how excited they were Absolutely. to be out there? Absolutely. If anything, I needed a nap at the end of the day. And I certainly want to thank Snowy Owl Dog Tours for their hospitality. We had such an amazing time there. Hey, if you're old enough, you probably heard of the Cisco Kid, a fictional heroic Mexican cowboy. Have you ever heard of a rare fish called Cisco? We now go to Cold Lake for an underwater research project the scientists hope will improve their chances of lassoing the Cisco fish. There are at least six or seven different species of Cisco's. These fish come in all sizes and closely resemble whitefish, except for one important physical distinction. Easiest way to tell a whitefish, a lake whitefish from a, from a Cisco, is in the shape of the mouth. You can see on the whitefish here, the mouth is actually, even though this is just a cast, the mouth is underneath the snout. The snout is actually sticks out quite a bit beyond the, the tip of the lower jaw. In the Cisco's, you can see the lower jaw is actually as long as the upper jaw. So it's, it's called a terminal mouth. When the mouth is closed, the, it, it, it comes right to the end of the, of the head. Now studying this fish has been something of an obsession for Mark, especially when it comes to trying to understand why the short jaw Cisco is the only species to appear in Barrow Lake. My first thought was, well, probably two things. Either it's been misidentified and they're, they're probably up there all over the place. It's also, because it was such a remote location, it's, it's only been found in, Barrow Lake is north of Lake Athabasca, so it's a fly-in only, there's no roads, there's no cut lines, there's no way to get in there, so it's very remote. Either. People haven't found them because they haven't looked or they were just misidentified because they are, they are fairly difficult to tell apart. There's, there's really no, no question that if you don't count the gill rakers and do a, a good detailed analysis in the lab. So my thought was they're probably up there. They were candidates for listing, particularly here in Alberta and, and nationally uh, as an endangered species. And I, I wanted to see, you know, really is this, are they really as rare as we think they are? In order to determine just how many fish are in Barrow Lake, Mark and fellow scientist Dave Parama need to test out a live capture net. So they've come here, the cold lake, to conduct the test. 
So I'm told that our chances of seeing a Cisco inside this fish trap are pretty slim, but we won't know until we dive on the site. Once in the water, Mark and Dave set about the task of stringing out this net. No easy job given the limited visibility. So I try to keep tabs on their progress through the radio. Mark, this is Mike. I think we can receive, but they can't hear us. We don't know what's going on below the surface of this calm lake. <laughs> I guess the, the idea here today is to determine whether or not you've built a better mouse trap. <laughs> yeah, that's basically what we're trying to, trying to figure out a way to trap these fish. Traditionally, we would be gill netting them. That causes a lot of mortality, so we were trying to figure out a, a new way to trap these things and try to get a hold of them, see them, maybe video them, and then let them go without even having to handle them would be preferable. For Dave Parama, who heads up the education department at the museum, research into this fish holds other benefits as well. Part of our mandate within the museum is uh, environmental programming and environmental education. So, so we do what we can to raise awareness among students and, uh, and the, ge the general public about issues like that. So the net performed well, resulting in at least two fish swimming into it, although no ciscos were captured which really didn't surprise these scientists, given that they have dived here for two and a half years and have yet to see a Cisco. That is until this happened. As we were heading back to the dock, Mark spotted something floating on the water. So all that work, Mark, and Mother Nature provides the... Just device. puts one right in front of us on the boat. That's the way it should be. Good eye. Yeah, no, I just thought that looks like a Cisco. I mean, it could have been a whitefish too, but... Oh, it is. We got one. <laughs> I guess even in science, it helps to get lucky every once in a while. Cool. Yeah, Good. excellent. Coming up, we head out on the water in force with Alberta Park Conservation Officers. The Alberta Conservation Association is proud to be partnered with Alberta Fish and Game Association. Alberta Hunter Education Instructors Association. Alberta Professional Outfitters Society. Time now for a look at our outdoor community calendar. Oil companies like Devon Energy are always looking for better, more environmentally friendly ways of doing things. That often means abandoning conventional ways of thinking and going outside the box. Take pipeline trenching, for example. How can less soil be disturbed? Here's a look at some new ideas that are being put to the test. No, I just Since 2009, a number of environmental advances in Alberta's oil and gas industry have been developed and tested here at the Evergreen Centre for Innovation. With 14 acres of forested land, industry can experiment with different approaches to issues they may face while working in the field. Well, it's, you know, Michael, it's been 30 years of, of working with the industry and the community and, and, and uh, move, we're moving from a command and control system in government to one more based on uh, environmental outcomes. And uh, we know that we needed to do something different. And so this is kind of a way of our expression of and, and working together with the industry and the community to develop innovative resource solutions, showcase and demonstrate those to the global community that we're doing something different. We, we were able to get all that material back. Almost 15,000 kilometers of pipeline is laid in Alberta on an annual basis. Work done at the center resulted in a more environmentally friendly way to go about it. You know, getting industry to, to recognize that instead of, you know, using a, a wide bucket for a three-inch diameter pipeline, we could, you know, narrow this down, improve their economics on it, 
reduce the environmental footprint because this requires a lot less storage to store the spoil, right. which essentially means we don't have to remove as many trees. It's this collaborative approach between industry and government that really seems to be making a difference. It, it's amazing, you know, the people that normally weren't thought that they were very innovative come out of the woodwork and they say, well, geez, if we knew that you really wanted this, we could do that. This gives them an opportunity to trial and, and demonstrate and, and conduct a little bit of research on some of their practices without fear of, you know, causing environmental harm, so to speak. Being free to think outside the box seems to be setting the stage for innovative environmental approaches that can have a significant impact on our landscape. Provincial Park Conservation Officers must be prepared to respond to any kind of emergency. Out on the lake, high waves, lightning storms and other difficult weather conditions can be challenging. Knowing how to handle your boat in rough waters requires practice. We hopped on board with COs for a training session on Pigeon Lake. Hey everyone, we're out here on Pigeon Lake joined by a number of conservation officers as we go through the ropes of learning how to operate these craft, craft that may save your life if you get into trouble on one of the provincial park lakes. With almost 95% of Alberta parks situated around water, conservation officers must be ready to respond to any emergency situation. So annual training is held to refresh and train new officers. Throughout this week-long course, that's what we're all about. We're trying to build up operator competency uh, and getting our operators comfortable in these boats and so they can go out on Alberta lakes and uh, conduct controls and promote water safety. Perfect. On larger bodies of water like Pigeon Lake, officers need to get comfortable with the handling of these rescue boats. So a number of maneuvering drills are carried out. Clear. One of the first drills to be implemented is something called riding the rooster tail. Uh, while a lot of fun, the procedure has a practical side. It's another maneuver to focus on steering, uh, throttle control and uh, boat positioning. And uh, uh, it's actually, it's a lot of fun uh, once you're on, on the tail. So. <laughs> At times looking a little like a New York City traffic cop, Bart had each boat approach at full speed, then pull alongside his boat so that each officer could demonstrate throttle control and maintain their position. For conservation officer Shyla Weiss, the course proved to be a valuable experience. Some have some boating experience. I didn't have a lot of boating experience coming into the course, so um, I've definitely learned a lot in the couple days that we've been out here, and I feel a lot more confident in my boating abilities. It's the building of that confidence that is critical so that officers can perform various tasks when patrolling on the lakes around our provincial parks. They can perform um, um, hard tasks out on the water, and some of those hard tasks include conducting uh, rescues, patrolling and making sure that other recreational boaters are, are recreating in a safe manner. And uh, we have to have really competent operators out there so it goes smoothly. Conservation officers and park service rangers are responsible. One of our main mandates for Alberta parks is ensuring uh, public safety uh, in our Alberta parks and often lakes are, are adjacent to Alberta parks. And so we will conduct uh, uh, public safety uh, checks out on the water to ensure that all activities are being conducted in a safe fashion. As to the success of this training program, Bart was more than pleased with the abilities demonstrated by all involved. It's looking pretty good. I, I thought it went really well today and everyone was looking pretty sharp. Still to come, Mary will be hitting the books to start her outdoor education. The Alberta Conservation Association is proud to be partnered with Alberta Trappers Association, Nature Alberta, Wild Sheep Foundation Alberta,
Time now for a look at our outdoor community calendar. There is a school program designed to provide students with an unbiased approach to how our natural resources are formed and extracted. No question, that can be a complicated subject, but these kids from a school in Rocky Mountain House seem to grasp the concept. We're here at St. Matthew's School where we're really getting a good idea of what it means to be a steward. All of these 46 students are working hard being good stewards for the environment. I would suppose any day out of the classroom would be welcomed, but these guys are ready for some hard work. Their mission is to create an outdoor classroom so they can better understand the environment. The project was made possible through the Energy in Action program. This program will allow students to learn about their natural environment. From studying soil and weather patterns to plant cycles and insects, it's a classroom that reflects what nature has to offer. The Energy in Motion program brings together member companies who in turn provide the volunteer base to allow the kids to build the type of classroom that will reflect their needs in just one day. In this case, 12 various oil and gas companies provided their time and efforts to help with this project. In time, this outdoor space can evolve, depending on the requirements of the type of outdoor education courses to be carried out. Anybody have an idea what this is? Since its inception back in 2004, over 80 schools have been involved with the Energy in Action program, and more want to get involved. The success of the program, in part, can be attributed to the fact that there is a real educational benefit to the students without adding to a school's bottom line. This is something that we've wanted to do for a long time. We've talked about it in Parent Council, how a courtyard uh, rejuvenation would be a great thing for St. Matthew's School. We're very grateful for the Energy in Action grant that got this project off the ground. They gave us uh, $5,000 of uh, seed money to get it going. Please put it around. There you go. No question, the transformation of the space is dramatic and no doubt will be a focal point when it comes to outdoor education. Hi, I'm Brad Fenson with the Alberta Fish and Game Association with your outdoor tip of the week. We just put up a bunch of firewood here so that we can sit around and enjoy an evening campfire. Anyone that has spent time out camping probably has cut firewood. I know my brothers and I used to compete for some axe time. We were always wanting to be the one to chop the wood. And of course we did more than just splinter the logs. We, we actually broke many an axe handle over the year or actually split them. Of course nowadays they come out with new products like this fiberglass handle with an, a built-in shock absorber so that you don't actually break that when you're out there. I'm going to show you a quick and easy tip today and I'll use this hatchet as an example. You can actually use the shock absorbers on these too. How to tie them up to save your axe handle just in case you miss your target when you're out there. We're going to take some three quarter inch nylon rope and we're just going to start it right below the head of the axe and we're going to take it and wrap it tight starting at the bottom, working down towards the base of the handle. Just get it in there nice and tight so that it sits up against each other on each wrap. And when you're done, what we're going to do is we're just going to finish it off with another piece of duct tape. We're going to take this and wrap it around to seal basically the rope in place. And what you'll end up having is a nice padded shock absorber so that when you're chopping and you actually hit the log with the handle instead of the head, it won't split the handle. That'll actually work as a shock absorber. Your handle will always be safe and ready to use on your next outing. The Alberta Conservation Association is proud to be partnered with Pheasants Forever Alberta Council. Treaty 8 First Nations of Alberta. Trout Unlimited Canada. Time now for a look at our outdoor community calendar.
if, like me, you want to start hunting for the very first time, it's mandatory to take the Alberta Hunter Education course. Since the 1970s, this course has been providing the foundation to safe and ethical hunting in Alberta. Welcome to the Conservation Hunter Education program and the course. We're going to be running for the next three evenings and all day Saturday. It's a long one. And then you get to come back on Sunday and write the exam. I must admit it's rather cool to be taking part in a program that has seen over a million students just in Alberta. I've never hunted myself so I wasn't too sure what to expect as things got going, but it didn't take long to realize some of the top people in their fields would be guiding us through the course. Understanding the rules and regulations are a big part of hunting. Well, good evening. It's good to see a new class of uh, up and coming hunters doing it the right way. Basically the kids nowadays uh, they have no use for people that poach or abuse our wildlife or fisheries. They have no use for polluters. And it's just a real refreshing attitude change for me knowing that, you know, in the 35 years I've been here, you're seeing some changes because if it was same old, same old, I probably wouldn't be here. Then things turned to a more philosophical approach with Kelly, who asked us to think about why we hunt. We often get the question, why do women hunt? Well, we hunt for the same reasons guys do. I like to go out and shoot moose and elk and deer and put them on my table as much as my husband does. And so we both enjoy that pleasure. The more appreciation that you show for the animal that you harvest, the more hunting will mean to you and the more that you'll be able to pass on to others. I shot a a deer out of my blind one night and then the next night we had the tenderloin and we had potatoes from the garden and salad I'd made and fresh buns and I was like check out this this whole meal I did it all by myself it was on this theme that really struck a chord with one of my fellow students actually how much hunters care <laughs> about the environment it was it was a big eye opener like uh, I almost felt that I learned more about wildlife conservation and even just about wildlife in general Perhaps there is no greater tribute to hunting and what it means to have this privilege than when it's viewed through the eyes of a new Canadian. I'm so excited and I look forward to it. <laughs> and you'll get to spend time with your son, right? Son, yeah, and hopefully my, my family as well, because we always go out together. What surprised me is the fact that this Alberta-based hunting course is recognized not only across Canada, but internationally as well. It's accepted and acknowledged in every province and territory in Canada, as well as 56 other jurisdictions worldwide. It's actually been around for quite some time and we've won awards for it and things like this. That's the outcome of this. Now before I let Len go, there was just one more thing I needed to ask him. So being such a seasoned pro, can you give me any insider tips that maybe weren't covered in this course? Um, uh-huh. Yeah. Okay, that's good. I will but definitely... Don't share that with anyone. I will, no. No question. One of the things I took away from this hunting course is the fact that, well, it's not really a hunting course. If you have any desire to be in the outdoors, then this program is for you. Look what I did. Mom and Dad, are you proud of me? Well, Mary, it looks like you weren't the only woman taking the course. No, there were three of us there. I want to know what you got for a final mark. I got 98%. 98. Well, it wasn't 100, but well done nonetheless. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> Mary, I know that we're all excited to follow your progress as you move closer to your first hunt. I appreciate that. If you would like to catch previous stories featured here on Let's Go Outdoors, then track down our website at www.letsgooutdoors.ca. Remember, the outdoors is here for all of us to enjoy. If you see someone taking away from that enjoyment, call the Report a Poacher line. Till next time, I'm Elma Mehmedbegovic. I'm Mary Hulbert. And I'm Michael Short. Let's Go Outdoors. I know where I want to be Outside, wild and free. Let's go outdoors. Let's go outdoors. You and me. Let's go outdoors where the waters run clear and cold. Mother Nature's world is better than gold. So much to see, so much to do. Let's go outdoors.